Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Product School. Uh, today I'm here with Andrew Chan, who's the co-founder at Explow. Uh, welcome to the show, Andrew. Thank you, Carlos. Glad to be on the show. Andrew, I know your product is being used by a lot of product people. Uh, can you tell us more about what is Explow exactly? Yeah, definitely. So Explow is an embedded analytic solution. What that means is that we'll work with product teams, uh, a lot of SaaS companies. Um, they'll use our product to build out analytics experiences whether that's dashboards, or reporting interfaces, they'll fully customize it, white label it, and then embed it into their own solutions. So all of those uh, use cases are gonna be geared towards building uh, analytics in their own systems and then showing that to their end users. So embedded analytics, um, when I think about the word analytics, like a lot of other words come to mind, like business intelligence or product analytics. So, Companies like Tableau, Looker are probably very big in business, business analytics. I think about Amplitude or Mixpanel in product analytics. Like, how do you position your product specifically the the analytics, the embedded analytics cat category? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, we get this confusion all the time. I, I think there's a few different categories, right? There's the general BI or business intelligence space. That's where Tableau, Looker, a lot of those bigger players play, and that's really designed for your team to have a general all-purpose uh, so an analytics solution. So everyone within your company can go in, see charts, graphs, dashboards on their own KPIs. Um, with regards to product teams and product managers specifically, um, a lot of those uh, users will live more in product analytics specific tools. Um, those are going to be the mixed panels, amplitudes of the world. Those will connect to product data and you can surface any sort of analytics insights specifically on uh, those pieces. And there's a lot of um, other specific analytics tools, whether it's product analytics or other uh, sort of industries that focus specifically on more uh, niche use cases. For us, we build embedded analytics solutions. And to sort of reframe that, it's almost um, not even a BI solution, but it's more of a product development solution. So our users are actually using Expo to build experiences and UXs within their own um, applications. So the use case is not you know, sharing data internally with your own team, but it's all sharing data outside of your own company. So as someone who maybe runs a SaaS company, I need to share data analytics with all of my users and external parties. That's when you would use something like embedded analytics to build that into your own solution. So I can imagine a lot of those SaaS products already offer some level of insight or analytics, right? So as a PM, at what point should a PM consider uh, adding more to the what their uh, existing product is, is already offering? Yeah, there's a definitely a few turning points um, in terms of a company's sort of analytics offering uh, and a few uh, sort, of, uh, sort of times when they would actually consider outsourcing this. You know, the first is when they do have nothing. You know, we do work with a lot of startups who are building the MVPs or exploring new products. And instead of dedicating weeks, if not months up front to build dashboards reporting for their users, um, they can spin something up very quickly with something like Explo, you know, in as little as uh, 30 minutes, an hour uh, to get like an MVP up. So that's one piece. Um, the second is, you know, a lot of our clients will come to us, like you said, with initial dashboards. You know, they might have built a very simple dashboard for their users. And they're realizing that, one, their users are just asking for much more, right? And their teams are going back and redesigning dashboards, adding more charts, graphs, features, et cetera. Or two, they're moving up market and each of their clients has their own custom needs. And it's very difficult to dedicate the time to building out custom sort of reporting experiences within their software. So. You know, a lot of companies, again, come to us after they've built an MVP out and they realize, you know, we thought this would take two weeks to build, and it did. And now they're realizing they're dedicating more and more sprints as time goes along to continue to iterate and work on these dashboards. Um, and it's taken, you know, at the end of the day, a full engineer's time to just to maintain these um, going forward. So then they'll th re sort of rethink their strategy and say, you know, maybe it's best to outsource this to a tool like ourselves. Yeah, it's a classic buy versus build dilemma that we've seen across different pieces of a product, right? Like, yes, your team can build uh, analytics. Yes, your team can build other pieces that are becoming more of a commodity. And uh, it's probably more efficient to outsource to a specific company that can 
build it and maintain it for you, at least 80% of the use cases. So yeah. your team can focus on the unique value that they can create that nobody else is. Um, but it usually comes from like a personal problem, you know, like for you, like very analytics and something very, very specific. Like how did you get to where you are now? Like what was that initial problem? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And to be honest, it's not a really straightforward answer. Um, took us about uh, a year of building different products and testing them and launching them to, to sort of find this uh, sort of issue to work on. Um, I guess the, the sort of months leading up to embedded analytics, we were working on a separate uh, data tool. Um, so we we're working on a tool at that time, we called it Explo as well. It was really a sort of low code interface to explore data. Um, myself, I come from uh, sort of an analytics data science uh, background, but I was not the most technical. I was not an engineer, um, but then diving into a lot of data uh, on the sort of modern data stack, um, I realized the need for sort of low-code solutions in this space. So myself, my co-founder, were working on sort of competitors to a lot of the BI solutions that were very low-code. Um, and then we realized after working with a few users that there was a growing need for sharing this data outside of their own company. Again, as I mentioned, BI solutions are designed for teams to really be able to collaborate and within their own, their own company, um, sort of explore and monitor data. But once it came to sharing that with your users, with your partners, um, different sort of external parties, that's when those solutions sort of broke down. And so we got a lot of pull from those initial users to actually uh, work on an embedded solution or a solution dedicated to external uh, data sharing instead. And at that time, we we made the choice of completely scrapping our own product um, and, and building a new one, which is uh, the current Excel product. And we made that really conscious decision because we did realize that a lot of the BI solutions were sort of retrofitting their existing tools to become embedded or to solve this use case, but that's exactly where it was breaking down. And so instead of uh, you know, deciding to do the same thing, we made a decision to just scrap everything, start from scratch and, and build Explo. And, and just to get a snapshot of your company, so you've been, you started around five years ago, right? And uh, two years ago, you announced that uh, you raised $12 million Series A. Yeah, so the again, the first sort of year was just exploration. We had a ton of ideas outside of data space as well. We uh, went through the YC program in SF. So myself, my co-founder moved across the country to do YC, probably launched and, and uh, killed 10 products within three months, um, <laughs> built the initial sort of data product that we were talking about, raised a series or a seed round um, at that time. Um, and then, yeah, it took us another eight months maybe to find um, these sort of embedded analytics solutions. So we launched with our first customer on our current product in early 2020, I believe. So it's been about four years uh, since we've actually launched our product. And I, I saw um, that you guys closed some very large companies in the Fortune 500 category. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how those clients influenced your roadmap, as you think about building a platform that is going to be used by tons of different companies and you get this classic whale that is saying, well, you need to build this specific feature for me or I won't buy. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely a challenge. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think for us, we have built a lot of custom features and, and our customers really have driven a roadmap from day one. You know, the entire pivot and the initial product was, was built, uh, you know, after we actually sign an initial customer actually. So, um, you know, we've always worked obviously very close with our customers. With those larger customers, it's it's two things. One was getting the product enterprise ready. And that was just a time investment we had to decide to make. You know, before we even signed or closed the deal, there were just certain uh, features. One simple example is uh, sort of a single sign-on support. You know, for example, that's something we just needed to build for enterprise. and. We just needed to take the time to do that. Other sort of legal compliance measures uh, we had to do as well. Um, and again, just making that upfront investment, we know that we need to move into larger companies and that's just something we need to do. Um, and then, you know, in terms of actually working with those companies, you know, it is going to be a challenge always to balance uh, specific needs and, and maybe one-off 
uh, sort of features with the general roadmap, but it's really two things. One is understanding the lift and impact of those asks um, and really clearly defining with the champions that we're working with in the sales process, you know, what are the things you actually need and, um, you know, what are what is blocking this deal, right? And very straightforward, we created a Google Sheet, listed those things out, went through those week over week um, and understood exactly what was needed, what wasn't, had them prioritized for us as well. And then, you know, from our side, it's really a decision, you know, the big shiny logos are, are definitely great to chase and obviously the the revenue component as well. But, you know, we have to just go, go check ourselves um, once in a while and say, you know, is this really guiding us in the right direction? Is this a feature that only one customer is going to use? Are we going to have to maintain it? Um, and, and just being being really, uh, yeah, just committed to, to sticking to our own vision. You know, uh, you know, there's been tons of companies that have come to us with random masks and, and the big companies as well. And we decide to you know not work with them for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, but, you know, it's really just, again, gut checking ourselves with those exact requirements and, and saying, you know, are these things we're going to work in the contracts? Are these things we're going to commit to? Or do they not make sense for us at all? And I, as I hear you talk about this, and it reminds me of a few concepts in product management. We don't sometimes call it persona or in sales, you just, used to call is to be called ICP, regardless of how you want to call the, the ideal customer profile or, or the user of your product. I think it's important to have one in mind, well-defined, be flexible enough to know when it makes sense to expand, but also not too flexible to the point that you end up creating a Frankenstein solution that is not really optimized for anybody. I think especially at the startup stage where you need to be hyper-focused on something and make sure that you are really excellent at something very specific instead of just good enough at a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think reflecting on that piece, it was always a challenge for us. And, and I think this is true of a lot of more horizontal products, especially in the data space, analytics space, you have tools that can, uh, you know, you look at Tableau and Looker, like those are general purpose tools, right? Any single company in the world could technically use them. Um, that spans from any industry within those companies, they're at least uh, selling that, you know, everyone can use them from the data teams to non-technical users to salespeople, et cetera. So, you know, it was, it's really difficult, uh, especially in the beginning. I think we were very lucky um, in that one, you know, we were sort of in the sort of obviously the VC backed world. And so a lot of our initial companies came from uh, that community as well. And just by chance, um, it's interesting, the first two customers or three customers we had were all virtual events platforms. This is also during 2020 when when COVID was uh, sort of moving everything uh, on online, and um, so we built the product specifically for essentially uh, virtual events platforms for, for the first couple of months. Um, then obviously we've expanded from there, and I think part of it was luck. You know, it wasn't us, you know, having an idea that that's exactly what we wanted to go for, but it did help us sort of create that initial roadmap and build a more specific tool compared to building something that could literally do, you know, anything and work with any company. Um, but it's been a challenge, you know, at our, at today's, uh, you know, even today we have customers across so many different verticals, uh, mostly still software companies, um, a lot of B2B SaaS companies, but we do cover a lot of different industries within that, you know, we have e-commerce companies, marketplaces, uh, companies that serve, trash companies and maintenance companies. So it is a wide range, but um, yeah, I mean, not gonna lie, it's been a challenge for us to focus um, even today on, on, you know, exact use cases and, and ICPs. Oh, one other thing that I noticed from your previous um, comment is, is that you were able to sell something before you actually built it. And I think there's a lot of power to that. It, it helps you prove if there is a real need for what you're trying to build. And it also helps you get more, in this case, enterprise ready to fully understand what's required to go for a deal. And especially as you think about something that is, is going to be more multi-year. So I think those are really good nuggets that apply not just to a founder, but also to a lot of PMs where they're in the, in the trenches trying to figure out what to build next. Yeah. Yeah. I think, again, you know, in the early days, maybe it was luck uh, that helped us out there. But I would say like one learning that we had, again, the current product wasn't the first one we launched. Uh, our previous data product, it was really interesting and we were super excited because we did launches on different platforms, 
um, and, and we got a bunch of signups and a bunch of users who said they want to use our tool before it was really built. No one who committed or signed or paid us anything, but we had you know hundreds of, of users who signed up, and we thought that was like amazing, right? Uh, everyone's so excited about this, and then we realized after hopping on those calls and giving them access to our first product that it just wasn't working. Uh, and we tried to do so many things, and these people are coming from all different roles in, in different companies and things like that. And you know, it's very exciting, but we did realize that we to your point was like, we're spreading ourselves too thin. We didn't have a real direction and we were sort of drawn in by the excitement of like a waiting list. Right. But I think that like within B2B SaaS and, and what we learned the second time around was we only had, you know, two, three companies for the first month, two months, three months who were working with us. And it was so different than the, you know, 500 person waiting list, but it was more committed uh companies and more committed users that really needed what we built and that's really really gave us the um sort of confidence that we could pivot ultimately and and work on the solution and it was again you know two to three really excited users compared to a list of 500 people who thought they wanted our product and, and really didn't so um that was definitely one big learning in the in the early days uh you know Andrew, I've, I've interviewed a lot of um founders and chief product officers on the podcast. And I noticed a, a consistent theme. A lot of them, they say, oh, I've been very lucky. And it's funny because you look back, in your case, you've been grinding for five years, pivoting multiple times, you know, closing, building, and then you say you're lucky. Well, yes, and, you know, it's not only luck. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, I hear you talk about, in some cases, things didn't work. So let's focus on, like, how do you measure success? And as a product, when you wear the, the product manager hat, uh, what are some of those key performance indicators that, has, that, that truly prove that your product is, is actually working for your customers? Yeah, I mean, for us, there's specific KPIs um, that we look at, right? Um, and I'm saying outside of revenue, obviously revenue, and especially at our stage, is, is very important you know, for ourselves and externally as well. But um, looking at the product specifically, you know, it depends, again, very, very much product by product. But for us, we look at, first off, um, embedded dashboard views. So what that means is, again, our clients, maybe a, a SaaS company, will embed our solution into their own product, and then they share that with their users. How many times are those end users looking at our dashboards? Right, that's the top line metric. Are your dashboards getting out there? Are people looking at them? Right, and then within that, we have more uh, specific events and, and actions that we track as well. So. Uh, we track things like exports. So you can export data from our, our dashboards. You can download anything into a CSV, Excel file, PDF file, et cetera. Um, so that just proves that there's more uh, sort of interactions and usage. Um, and, and then other sort of pieces like, uh, again, those end users building custom reports. Um, those are events we're tracking as well. So at, at the very high level, it is ultimately what our customers, customers are doing with our dashboards. Um, that's what really matters. You know, those are the people getting the value. If I take that a step, uh, I guess before that, it is going to. Uh, there are some uh, events we're tracking regarding our own customers as well. You know, how many dashboards are they building? How many times are they going in and editing dashboards? Uh, that was one big one that we we really uh, watch closely now. Is uh, when you, when you think about builder versus buy, right? If you just move over to Explo, you build it once, you don't touch it again. That's not as much value as if you use Explo, built the initial dashboards, and then every single week, you know, it doesn't have to be a very long time. You know, we are saving you time, but it can be, you know, every other week coming in, adding a chart, uh, making small tweaks and changes, uh, and basically constantly iterating on our product and using it again like a product development tool and, and continually uh, improving that. So, you know, there's a lot of KPIs we track. Again, at the end of the day, it's it's really are the end users using these dashboards giving value? And then we're also looking at our own users and seeing you know, sort of how active they are in the platform um, and using you know, standard product analytics tools like uh, we segment Amplitude, for example, to look at a lot of those stats. For me, one of the takeaways here is your success is your customer's success. So looking at what are your customers' KPIs and how you can help influence those, is ultimately going to help you be successful. 
So I, I, I like how you, you put it that way and like going specific into like how many dashboards are they actually creating? How often are they checking them out? Like what is the actual value they're getting from your product way before the renewal time comes around? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, that's helpful for ourselves to track, but also, like you said, it, it's KPIs that our, our clients are tracking. And that's why actually in the platform, we expose all those as well. You know, we're exposing all the same information we're seeing on our side to our customers. Um, and, and they're, uh, they're tracking that you know, on their side to make sure that they are getting the value out of Exflow as well. Oh, because, yeah, I mean, your company, this, is, this might be a very full circle moment where you, you use Exflow for your company too, right? Yeah, your absolutely. Company. Yeah, we have dashboards embedded in Expo, <laughs> uh, built in Expo. So, yeah, I mean, so, it's, it's helpful for us too. One of the things that come, come to mind as a product person and think about integrating with other products out there is a, yeah, how hard or easy it is to actually integrate. Like, do I need to bring in an engineering team? Or like, how are you thinking about allowing non-super technical users to connect directly with your product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the integration piece is, is key. You know, we are trying to be uh, product team friendly, you know, developer first. And um, the integration process is actually very straightforward for us. You know, that's not really where the blockers lie typically. We do require some uh, engineering effort just to get the initial dashboards, reports, et cetera, embedded into the systems. Um, but otherwise, after that, it's, it's completely automated. Um, you know, you'll integrate the API as well, can the API with updates. You can go on the platform and make updates as well. But um, there's really uh, an upfront cost that's maybe 30 minutes to an hour to get this thing embedded. And then from there, you should be good to go. I have uh, another hot topic that I want to bring up here, which is uh, designs or redesigns. I know you are, have a strong opinions around how important it is, but you are also aware of how disruptive it can be for, for people internally, right? So how do you think about being a, doing a successful redesign? Yeah, I think in terms of design, you know, in full transparency, um, I'm not a designer. My co-founder didn't come from a design background. It's actually interesting. Our first full-time hire was a designer because we didn't realize, you know, for this sort of product that it was super crucial to uh, sort of be design focused. Um, but I, I think like one, one thing about design and, and like redesigns in general is that they are going to cause uh, some controversy, you know, and I think that's something that you just need to accept and, and embrace almost, you know, when you redefine or revamp something like, for example, for us, this is maybe a year, year and a half ago, we completely redesigned the, uh, sort of landing screen when you get into the application, just the way you navigate through dashboards and reports, um, you know, people logged on and maybe we didn't give enough warning or something, but it looked completely different, you know, one day. And, and I think that, you know, we got some positive feedback. We got some negative feedback. Um, I think people are very careful about launching or redesigning and, and putting those things out there. But I think for us, you know, and what I've realized is that it is, it's not necessarily a bad thing um, to get people a little bit fired up and ask you questions like, hey, why does this look completely different? Um, you know, it gets you a lot of good feedback and you understand, you know, what people are expecting and what they like and what they don't like. And so, you know, sometimes you just got to pull the trigger and, and just, you know, revamp things and, and shoot it out into the world. If it's a mistake, you know, it's a mistake. You know, you learn from those mistakes. Maybe you roll it back. Maybe you don't. Um, but yeah, I just think that, you know, if you're revamping or redesigning your platform and you don't get some negative feedback, then maybe the changes you made weren't, weren't big enough, you know? Yeah. And, you know, Every time I, I, I hear a word that starts with RE, like redesign or reorg, I know that can be controversial. And usually it's the CEO or the founder who has the authority to, to call that shot and, and go for it. Because, you know, by default, things are kind of working. Nobody will want to complain too much. Like nobody will come, nobody has ever come to me and say like, we need to fully redesign the, the website. We need to fully reorg. The team, but yeah. we know that it's healthy to do it every once in a while, and it's also important to do it thoughtfully and like, give enough time to team and users to, to to explain the benefits and also be careful with the testing. So whatever is not going well, you can roll it back. But ultimately, I think not doing a redesign or doing not doing a reorg is ultimately bad for the business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, th those are big choices in a lot of cases, and also. 
it's part prioritization as well. You know, like if things are working, you know, why why redesign it, right? Especially when you have an infinite pipeline of product feature mm -hmm. requests and other sort of things you could be building. Um, but you know, that is a decision that that is uh, made. You know, when, when we're prioritizing um, work uh, to do and, and updates and things like that, and uh, you know, sometimes, admittedly, we we do it too late. You know, sometimes we look at our platform, or I look at you know screenshots of my platform. Uh, you know, even eighteen months ago, and I'm like, wow, I can't believe like it looked like that. And you know, I'm so glad we did that revamp or whatever. It's like it's crazy, you know, how much uh, how quickly we can move. Also, and it's it's your baby, and I think you need your baby gives you the 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 right to criticize it and like try to make it better, and in a way feel. Ashamed is a good sign. It means that you've made a ton of progress. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's talk about AI. It's it's hot, although you guys have been in the analytics space since the beginning. Uh, curious to know how Gen AI has influenced your roadmap. Yeah. So uh, we do have AI features um, built into our platform today, and it's something that we are dedicating um, a lot of time to as well. Um, you know, especially within the analytics data space, it, it's so sort of integrated with AI that, um, you know, first off, we do see the potential, right? And, and that's why we've uh, very quickly implemented a, a few different sort of AI features in our platform. So let's say those end users can come in, ask any sort of questions around the data, we'll generate a chart, a graph to answer that, right? And I think that initially it was really like, this is super interesting, exciting, and, and cool. Uh, right, let's test it out. But then, of course, we started getting a lot of pull from our, our clients as well and, and prospects. Um, so we are dedicating um, like complete work streams to um, adding AI features and improving uh, some of the AI features we have today. And I think that it's it is a differentiator uh, for sure uh, compared to other products. But also, you know, there's there's also infinite sort of uh, ways this could go and infinite ways to use AI within our products. So. I think part of it really is just getting into our product, seeing what it can do, understanding and exploring new opportunities as well, because uh, we know how sort of transformational it can be. Because let's, let's talk about specific examples here. So I saw back in the day when some of these tools came up, they became very low code or even no code. They allowed an entire new generation of non-technical people to start just using data or build faster. Mm -hmm. With AI, I, I, I think there's an opportunity, for, especially for, for non-technical folks, to, to do even more. You mentioned the example of like, oh my God, just type something and then suddenly you get a new chart or graph. So what are other specific examples where you see your users get value out of these uh, AI features? Yeah, I mean, it can be sort of larger initiatives like that sort of end user feature I talked about. It really is allowing those end users to converse with data. Right and draw insights and create charts, dashboards, et cetera, without writing the line of code or even configuring their own charts and graphs. So that's sort of like the, I guess the, the main, uh, we'll say like user facing feature. Um, but there's so many like small things that we've added into the product, um, just stemming from the way that, you know, I use AI myself. Um, and, you know, one example is our, our platform product is completely SQL based. Right, it, we connect with SQL databases. There's a SQL editor. We have a sort of SQL data modeling layer, um, and even we use AI to resolve queries. You know, and the, there's features within the product. If something doesn't work, we have an AI plugin. Essentially, says, okay, I analyze your query. This is probably what's going wrong. Um, all the way to just sort of formatting dates. You know, I can. We have a tool where you can type in. Uh, how does BigQuery expect to see October 31st, 2021? And it just generates something that's all AI powered as well, right? Um, like those small sort of things that I'm using OpenAI for or perplexity or whatever, uh, we started to build in the product as well. So it's just like these little uh, sort of AI hacks that just make your life a lot easier. Um, those are, you know, some of the most helpful features that, that we've launched. Uh, thank you for clarifying because I, I see those two layers. So one is the big swing AI feature that is meant to disrupt mm -hmm. your product. And I think there's a lot of smaller wins that still add in a ton of value to the user and sometimes don't need to be called AI. I mean, that right now, calling everything AI helps for marketing purposes as well. But like, even if they don't have that denomination, 
that is still helping. And I ultimately believe that, especially in a B2B SaaS product where you are selling, uh, I guess, productivity, right? Or like a better understanding of your customers that can lead to an increase in, in the revenue. Uh, yeah. That is an easier thing to, to track and prove. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, we make our own product more usable, uh, more accessible to other people and, and, you know, make their workflows uh, quicker. You know, that's, that's where, uh, you know, a lot of our clients are getting value. So, yeah, I think you know on the head. It's not necessarily like the huge AI feature launches even, but just like the small day-to-day -day things, you know, that could help uh, simplify a product manager or a developer's workflow. And um, how do you think about the future of embedded analytics, uh, being one of the pioneers that productize that? Yeah, I, I think that embedded analytics, one we've seen is, is grown. Uh, and, and that's really just due to the fact that as mentioned before, we know that sharing data outside of your internal company, uh, you know, within the confines of your own company is in increasing. You know, not only do you have to understand your own data, but you have to share it out with your customers to prove value and to, uh, to give them the information they need to make other decisions and, and things like that. And we're seeing um, integrations between platforms, obviously, uh, ways to different, you know, share data and whatnot. And I think that you know, for us, embedded analytics is ultimately the start of what we're doing, right? We're building these solutions that allow companies to easily create their own dashboards and reporting experiences. But that goes so much farther than just uh, embedded dashboards, but that really spans into, as a company, how are you sharing data with other companies, right? And that's ultimately where we're trying to uh, own the space and own the market. We're not trying to compete with the lookers, tableaus, et cetera, the world and go into internal BI, but you know, anytime you need to share data with your customer, you know, we want to be the platform that does that for you, whether that is through a dashboard or whether that's from streaming data or whether that's from email reporting or sending data through Slack. Um, there's so many ways to sort of share data that uh, that's ultimately where I feel like what we call today embedded analytics is going to go in. Yeah, because I think the word embedded sometimes gets associated with, well, it has to be embedded within your current product. But I think you can embed that in an email, in a Slack message, and in any other channel that you don't own. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when we started embedded analytics product or our embedded analytics product, it was considered a niche sort of, uh, sort of a niche offering that a lot of BI solutions might have been trying to tackle already. But, you know, again, one, the, the sort of niche market has grown into a multi billion dollar market. Um, and two, to your point, you know, it expands outside of like embedded in your application, right? But it's really customer facing analytics um, is sort of what we exactly nowadays. And again, any sort of data sharing, embedded dashboards, et cetera, designed for your customers, uh, that's ultimately um, the sort of space that Expo is trying to tackle. But thank you, Andrew, for your time. It's been great to, to learn from your own experience about how you are building your current product. Take care. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on the show and, and uh, have a good one.